All right, well, I guess we can go ahead and get started. I'm uh, David Preziosi with Preservation Dallas, and we're so glad that all of you are able to join us uh, in, in, for our uh, Summer Scissors series uh, tonight. Uh, we have three left to go uh, in, our, in our series, and uh, we're just excited that everybody's able to join us for this one tonight. It's going to be an, an exciting one. Uh, and I want to introduce uh, Irene Allender, um, our programs and membership uh, coordinator, who will uh, introduce our uh, speakers for this evening. Irene. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. We're glad that you guys are with us. Um, we do hope that you can join us next week as well. We've got uh, three more sessions in our um, series. And so our first our one next week is going to be the Kaufman County's Poor Farm. It's believed to be the only one left in Texas still owned by the county. Um, so we're really hoping to see that um, pretty soon. So our speakers tonight are David Buchek, a founding member of Stern and Buchek. Sorry, I have my notes over here. <laughs> uh, Delaney, she, um, I'm sorry, Delaney, um, she is with, um, she's the uh, project manager, and then Jordan Shelton is the, I'm sorry, Jordan is the project manager, and Delaney is a preservation specialist, all with um, Stern and Vitek. And so I'm going to lead it, um, turn it back over to them, and if you um, have any questions, put it in the Q&A or the chat at the bottom, and at the end we'll have a question and answer, and you can um, We'll talk about whatever you um, have a questions on later on. So I introduce our speakers. Thank you. We all wear many hats, so we can we can interchange these titles. I'm sure, I promise you. Um, <laughs> one of the things that we learned in this project is that putting human beings on the moon and bringing them back safely is considered by many to be one of the major milestone accomplishments of the human race, and it's. Um, and it has, a, it has a connection to the room that we're about to discuss because it was here in this room where um, the, the mission was controlled once um, the astronauts took off. And so um, um, what we will talk about that uh, in relation to the room, um, but in addition, we will talk about um, you know, how the room was first conceived, how it was um, altered over the years um, this room also became, you know, it was decommissioned at one point and it became very, very endangered. And, um, and so part of the story will, will be a preservation story about efforts to save uh, the room. Um, and, then, and then how, um, once the, the teams that we'll present um, were selected, how, how um, you know, basically the decisions and the research uh, was conducted and kind of what we found, because there are a lot of things that we'll discuss today that were found, um, information that was lost, but not, but still um, could be retrieved. So we'll advance to the next slide. So first, um, I, I can't hear the folks in the audience, but obviously I assume many of you may have visited the control room and the, and the, the base at NASA. Um, and whether or not you have seen a control room before the restoration or you've never seen the control room or you, you even saw the restoration um, of the control room, I believe today you may learn some things that you didn't learn um, before or after. But the first thing is that we are located um, on the edge of Houston, um, based basically on the edge uh, sort of um, Webster, Texas surrounds part of the base. But um, what you can see is um, near the, the bay, you can see the NASA, the NASA Johnson Space Center. That's the location. And here's an early picture of, of the base um, when it was first uh, constructed. Again, it was um, part of the story about the space race was to beat the Russians to the moon. And one of the ways they did this was to design the campus us using um, a kind of a modular design standards that um, many of the buildings have very similar components and they were able to mass produce them and erect them and do it in a very fast way. And, and so being fast and, and still being safe was still part of, part of the mission. And um, as you can see from the timeline that we're showing, um, uh, you can see w you know, when the construction started um, and building 30 where the red dot is located, that's the, that's the, that's the mission control room 
um, location. There are actually two mission control rooms that I will speak about today, um, but it's the, uh, the one that was used for Apollo 11 for manned space flight that we'll spend um, most of our time on. And in, in 19, 1973, um, the base was renamed after um, uh, President Johnson. So this is a, a photograph from 1964, uh, one of the NASA images. And um, you can see that this building um, is composed of, um, of, of three different areas. It's got a mission control um, a center. It has also um, a, a lobby and also administrative wing on the far right. Um, you can tell from the typology of these buildings, they're sort of, you know, they're kind of international style buildings and uh, the offices tend to have windows and um, the area where the red dot is located is a, is a building without windows. So it, this is a military installation and um, within this building are the control rooms and a myriad of supporting rooms and computer rooms that supported the mission. Um, there were two control rooms built um, and the one in the third floor is the one that we're, we're going to talk about today and that was called Mission Operation Control Room Number Two, uh, and the acronym for this is called MOKER Two. And below that room was an identical room uh, called MOKER One, which is where unmanned spaceflight was conducted. And that room, MOKER One, today has been largely stripped, and is today called Flight Control Room One, and it's uh, where the International Space Station is controlled from Earth. But that's the it's the lead station on Earth. Can advance another image. Here's a floor plan of the third floor. And the area in blue is really the area that the restoration uh, comprised. Um, if you look to number one, that's that's the actually that's smoker two itself. So that's the that's the room that the flight controllers are, are are located in. Um, um, it's a tiered space, which we'll explain as we move forward. But uh, number two shows the visitor viewing area. That's where the public could come in. Back in the early days, the public could just come on the base and just come into the room and there were no protocols. Um, room number three um, was the summary display projection room. And it's called the Bat Cave. It's a big black room full of mirrors and projectors um, that were projecting um, images on these very large screens. Um, and then uh, number four, you see this, what's called the sim room. That's a simulation control room. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later in, in the presentation about what was happening in that room. But basically they were running scenarios um, to kind of troubleshoot uh, issues that may be, may be faced. And then number five was, um, it's called the Roker. Uh, which is the recovery control room. And it's where um, the armed forces were working um, with the flight controllers to figure out where the astronauts would be making landing and they could pick them up um, uh, via the Navy. So um, that room has been greatly altered over time. It was not, uh, we were not given access to those areas. And so um, we'll speak how, we'll, we'll speak to how we made that um, uh, part of the other project without actually um, using that space. And then the next image will show sort of an axiometric kind of view of, um, of these spaces. So on the, um, on the far left, you see these um, kind of strange room with these floating rectangles. These are very large mirrors that are um, basically uh, the projection Many of the projectors are located and then they're either facing uh, backwards or they're facing sideways in order to, um, to get the focal length from the camera large enough. It needed more space between the camera and, and the screen. And to maximize room in the building, they use these mirrors for like rear projection. So um, uh, then the room with all the consoles, with the, with the numbers, these are the consoles, which, um, which we'll talk more about. That's where the flight controllers would sit and they're, these are really, very advanced communication devices for their time. They're like big, big iPhones, if you will. And then on the far right, you see a bunch of seats. That's the, that's the visitor viewing room where the public can come and look. So here's, here are a couple images. Um, you know, what we, um, 
um, in this room, um, many of the Gemini, uh, the program started with Gemini. Um, well, it's called Gemini. That's, that's the other thing. The Gemini program, uh, flight controllers call this Gemini. And um, the latter part of that program uh, started in this room and then transitioned to Apollo. And so on, on the left, you can see the different missions that were part of the Gemini program and the Apollo program. And you can see in the room that there's a lot of information on these large screens. Um, there are time clocks and, and there are numbers and uh, graphs. And um, as we'll explain, all of this was done um, before the digital world that we know today. And uh, many of the things that you see are actually based on superimposing multiple image making devices in order to create um, a composition of images that we, we do with the computer today. Um, this entire building had rooms of computers in it, and um, all of those computers combined have less power than your individual iPhone does today. So um, I might advance the next image. Um, now, in addition um, to Apollo, this building, um, this, so this interior was stripped, basically, um, and renovated for the shuttle program. So. Um, much of the uh, like the early shuttle programs also were were controlled out of this room, and um, they removed everything except those P tube stations. And um, we first thought everything was removed um, because we were when we were first hired, we were told um, we want you to restore this room. And um, but by the way, the carpet's been removed, the wallpaper's been removed, the ceiling tiles have been removed, um, almost everything in the room has been removed, and. Uh, the consoles have been reconfigured uh, from Apollo to shuttle and our mission was to figure out, you know, what in the room was actually still original, um, what should be in the room, what should be removed from the room. And, um, and so we'll talk more about that story as we move forward. But the, the key is that once it was um, deactivated, it was then open for tours. Um, it was open. It was also determined to be a National Historic Landmark, which not just the control room, but, but the entire Building 30 is part of that designation. And as we will talk, um, things started to deteriorate pretty uh, rapidly. So um, this is kind of what, the, like the first time Jordan and I went to a meeting here, this is kind of what we saw. Um, you'll notice these small paltry images on the screens. Um, with small slide projectors on the other side of the of that screen, uh, showing images that were never in the room, um, not like not during Apollo 11, and um, you can see that the consoles, which um, are still they're they're arranged in an Apollo arrangement, but they're still largely configured for shuttle, and they're devoid of life. They're devoid of all the things, uh, the personal items, also just the technology they were using. Um, but essentially this was, uh, when they decommissioned the room, there was kind of a small effort to restore the room. And this is what, this is what that effort produced as a restoration. And um, even though it looks kind of drab, it was, the first time we visited this room, just to know what happened in this room, it, you know, I guess in many ways it didn't matter to us. We were, were so um, beholden to just be in a place where history you know, had been made. But again, you know, our task with this project was to really um, make this authentic and uh, something that, um, that we could really be proud about. So again, another image of just kind of what it looked like. Um, uh, you can see that even while the carpet's not original in, at this time, um, because it was, it's, it's rolled carpeting um, on, um, on a raised floor system, and the raised floor system did not, um, it's not based on any known carpet tile, and so you couldn't use a carpet tile with nice clean edges. So um, over time, um, the edges become frayed, they started taping things. Um, and again, the building was, you know, it, it was, a, it was um, a place that everyone wanted to visit when you took a tour of Space Center Houston, but it was really kind of a sad state, state at this, at this uh, time. Uh, this is the view from the viewing room. Um, the carpet in the viewing room and the seat fabric is original in the viewing room. Um, again, you're seeing images on the screens that were not on the screens like during the Apollo program. Um, they, 
they hardly had video. They didn't have video landing. They just had a small video um, when they when they got out of the um, uh, the lunar lander. But over the years, people would come on these tours and they would vandalize things. Um, you know, behind the seats, you see these little what uh, uh, most young people call um, iPhone holders, but these are cigarette ashtray holders right there. And but most of the lids have been stolen and ripped off the top of them. Uh, graffiti on many of the wall surfaces. Um, you can see where things have been torn, and it was really quite tattered. You can see that even the even the um, the seats that um, in the room had to be taped at one point just to protect them before they were restored. And then again, just looking at the state of the room, um, you know, it had suffered. Uh, there was rusting metal. There, you know, we mentioned the carpet, um, and there were other dilemmas as well. Um, what you'll notice is that um, there were no a number of shuttle plaques because every time there's a mission in this room, the flight controller will install um, a plaque for that mission. And so the room was showing two different stories. One was Apollo and one was shuttle, uh, for the early shuttle uh, missions. And so one of the things we had to wrestle with is how do we return the room to an authentic um, room as it appeared for uh, Apollo 11, but still honor the, the shuttle program. And so we'll, we'll talk about how we did that as we go forward. So um, one of the things that um, is that when you start a preservation project, um, the first thing you need to know is what, it, what is it that you're preserving and what is it um, that you should do? Um, as I mentioned, um, it, it's our understanding that flight control had, had, had conducted some type of restoration, which is what everyone was looking at in these uh, pre-restoration pre photos. But there really wasn't uh, a preservation ethic followed, and there was no um, there's no guiding principle, you know, for that. Um, and and so this is kind of what um, was the start. So Sandra Tetley, who was the uh, stored preservation officer on the base, um, she had become very alarmed. There was a space camp held, and um, you, you remember seeing those consoles. The kids were racing up and down and over the consoles from top to bottom as if they were uh, running staircases, like stairs. Um, and she was so, um, she was sad and, and thought, I need to, I need to you know, talk to the National Park Service and ask for a grant and see what can we do. And so she, and she basically uh, made a request for a $6,000 grant and the National Park Service turned around and, uh, gave her $20,000 with another $20,000 matching grant to do an historic finishings report. And in this photograph on the far right, that, that's Sandra Tetley. And Sandra at Oakland was all of our, that was our boss uh, working for this project. Um, and on the far left, um, you'll see Gene France and Ed Pendel, which we'll talk more about. And there are a lot of uh, retired flight controllers in this room, along with other uh, staff. Um, uh, uh, from the base and from other organizations, um, including uh, Preservation Houston, that were part of this uh, consultation process about um, really, and really this process was trying to convince the NASA uh, uh, administration and, and the flight control that the building should be restored and that the building should be, this, this interior should be restored to match the historic nursing's report. And while that may seem like an easy task, it was not. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about that as well as we advance. So um, some of the really big heroes here are really the retired flight controllers because without them, the project never would have been restored. It would just be still, still looking as it did in that pre-restoration condition. Um, I mentioned, I mean, there were many flight controllers that are, were part of this, the success of this pro project. Um, and two that were the most, um, vocal and most seen often in the media, or Ed Fendel. Um, he's in the white shirt uh, on the right. And of course, he's, um, he's sitting down just to the, just on the, in the photograph on the left. Um, the man standing up on the left is uh, uh, one of the flight directors for the Apollo 11 program. That's Gene Kranz. And you can see Gene Kranz in the color image, um, kind of to the right of Ed, just uh, with his arms crossed. And these two really went toe to toe uh, with the with the NASA administration. There are a lot of issues of control. Um, 
involved. Um, this building is an active military installation. It still um, has missions going on. The room below this room is still the lead control room for the space station. And so flight control actually, you know, they were very concerned that anything we might do to restore the room might um, adversely impact the missions below. Um, space Center Houston, which is the nonprofit arm, um, you know, they, they were wanting to have tours and um, even while the work was happening. And then, um, and then we have the administration and everyone was kind of vying for control of the process. Um, and um, it was really um, Mr. Krantz and Mr. Fendel who really made it very clear that as far as they were concerned, the retired flight controllers, they, they wanted to see this um, room restored back to the way it was um, to, and, and to portray the room as they saw the room, um, but, you know, using Apollo 11, um, using the moment that we um, landed the astronauts on the moon as the sort of the time stamp for, um, for, for what this, for people, for what people would see. Um, and they refer to this room as their cathedral. Um, and, and again, they didn't have a, they didn't like, as we'll explain, they didn't have a motion camera showing the space craft landing, um, they were looking at graphs and looking at computer readouts saying that basically the computer had um, been overwhelmed and it basically uh, had, had rebooted itself and were wondering whether it was going to crash because um, it, it, things weren't going well. And again, it was just looking at data. And so um, they did not want to show things in the room that were not in the room. And at the time, um, there were a lot of... Um, there were folks who wanted to talk about going to Mars and have pictures of Mars on the screens. And, and, and so what you'll see in this presentation is that our work was really to put it back to this point in time. And, um, and it's based on uh, the moment that the spacecraft landed. Um, but the consoles um, reflect the actual configuration. The consoles are actually configured to Apollo 17, which was the height of the Apollo program. And so um, those are the sort of the two guiding principles for the project. Um, so these are sort of the, the big groups that really made things happen. Um, this group that I was describing to you, um, um, you know, basically we've got the Manned Space Flight uh, Operations Association, which is the retired flight operators. They meet once a week, anyone that's in Houston, in town. And, you know, they consider themselves the unofficial owners of the room. Um, of course, NASA is a property owner and um, is a federal agency um, in charge. And one of the problems we faced is that you can't give money to the government uh, unless it's your taxes. Um, uh, the idea of giving money to the government usually means you want something from them and you're expecting something back in a transactional way. And so um, it's, you know, that's why it's, it's very, it's, um, that's why you can't do it. So, um, and so, and this, this, was, this was a problem because the culture at NASA is that um, since the Vietnam War, uh, funding for the NASA program has been decreasing and everyone, you know, wants the funding that they do have to go to what is the next step, um, the, the current missions. And so the idea was to raise the money for, for the restoration from private uh, outside sources, which would not take away from the missions. And uh, the city of Webster, um, you see the logo here, they surround the base and they make so much money off of hotel motel uh, tourism because this is the draw um, in this, this part of uh, the greater Houston area that they basically you know, donated a huge amount of money starting with $3.5 million and then another matching um, grant of $500,000 and ultimately um, in total 5.5 .5 million was raised for the project but there wasn't a way to spend the money because it was a government installation. And that's where the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation uh, com comes into play. It's a quasi-federal agency that oversees the Section 106 process for historic properties. Um, they had a provision that you could donate money to them as a pass-through and they could donate the money to a government agency for preservation. But they had never, I think, passed more than $200,000 through that mechanism. and um, and the um, uh, Adam Graves, who we'll sp speak about, um, he was the lead preservation consultant for the overall team. 
um, knew of this revision and suggested that to the NASA attorneys. And, and for that reason, the project happened. Otherwise, the money never would have made it there. Um, and then the other big group, um, the Space Center Houston, that does the tours, and they also had a Kickstarter program that helped raise money, and it kind of worked um, in unison with uh, City of Webster. So we'll advance next image. So this is sort of a, a kind of a team of who was involved with this project. Um, again, the ultimate owner is uh, the NASA, and uh, Sandra Tetley was really our uh, liaison. At, at some point, um, NASA made the determination to follow um, the preservation path and follow the furnishings report. Um, and that, that then led the way to forming a team. Um, the project management was a company called Ayuda out of um, Denver, Colorado, who had a lot of experience um, managing large governmental projects. And then um, things were, um, when we first started, um, um, uh, Gravitate, which you see here, Adam Graves um, provided um, our, he was our LEAP uh, preservation uh, consultant for the, for the project and the longest running member of the team. Um, and then um, essentially our firm, Stern Beach, uh, was hired to handle the restoration for the interiors, the design, the artifacts, um, everything except for the console uh, restoration, which was done by a company called Cosmosphere out of Kansas, um, who are, they have a museum there. They actually own many of the um, consoles from uh, the Mission Control Room number one when it was stripped. They actually purchased those things and they, not only can they make, um, uh, can they restore museum pieces, they can also um, make sets for movie movies and films and they're, they're quite well known. So everything else though came, was kind of still back to our team to figure out. And so we, we put together a large group of uh, folks. And so in this image, we're just showing um, a number of the folks that we've worked with um, that uh, were experts in some field that we brought them in as a consultant. And then in many cases, they also performed an aspect of the work or um, or they would help to um, devise a spec for, for that work to occur. Um, and some that I'll just point out um, on source historical services, Yanni Langer out of Galveston, did a lot of the analysis. Um, and uh, George Weisinger with audiovisual guys was, um, his wife formerly worked in the room when it was in the Apollo program. Um, so as we go along, we'll talk more about more of these consultants as we move forward. Um, but this is kind of the kind of what we what we saw. So I'm going to walk you guys through. Um, I guess some, the following slides are kind of our process. So um, as the project team determined that uh, Apollo 11 and the, the moon landing was the moment of significance for the room, so um, that's the we kind of narrowed down um, our folk our our uh, research on that time frame. And tried to um, create the, return the room back to that significant um, time. Um, NASA provided us with um, hundreds of photos um, from spanning the entire Apollo era, as well as um, hours of, of videos during the mission. So um, we kind of wanted to share with you the uh, some of the photos and walk you through some of um, the kind of the items that we looked for. Um, to return the room. So in this photo, um, you can see on the, the wall plaques, we, we uh, originally, how the room is before we restored it, it was full of uh, shuttle plaques. Just um, So we, we had to identify the original plaques that were on the wall during Apollo 11. And uh, there was uh, Gemini plaques along the fur down below the lights. And then um, Apollo well, flight patches on the fur down right there. Um, we looked at the consoles and you'll see um, kind of ashtrays, coffee cups, staplers. Um, there's an RC cola can in the one of the flight controller's hands. And why this is significant is one of the requests from the Apollo flight controllers and the client was they wanted the room to look like all the flight controllers just kind of 
got up mid-mission and left. So we needed to stage the room as well as return, you know, return all the uh, kind of carpet, wallpaper, um, paint colors, all that back to the original setting as well. So we can go to the next slide. On this slide, you, you'll see that we, we kind of took note on the, um, all the tracking maps on the back of the consoles, the, um, all the clipboards hanging on the back of the consoles. Um, one of the consultants, uh, Cosmosphere, who's in charge of restoring the, the consoles that would took note of the button colors, which buttons were actually activated during a mission. Um, might be hard to see, but there is actually a model of an Apollo moon lander which maybe Delaney could point out with the cursor. Um, you have it right there. So um, we, we tried to track that down and um, return that. There's a, a tape recorder, briefcases, black binders. Um, and then on the far wall, there's um, a calendar. There's, um, there's also uh, like coat racks. And uh, I think that's about it for this photo. Oh, sorry. Um, this room, the simulation control room, actually had the least amount of photographic research for us to use. Um, this one we got kind of late in the project, but it it we it just verified our assumption that it was staged in a similar manner. Um, this this room was not active during a mission; it was used for training purposes. Our um, so. Uh, so in here, I just wanted to point out that there's, you know, wall-mounted monitors, which we were able to return to the room. Um, and then we kind of determined the wall color painting or the wall color finish. And the, uh, we kind of cleaned up the floor tiles in here and uh, put the consoles back the way they are. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the recovery control room, this, this room um, is no longer present. It, this area has been turned over to the, um, to the Air Force for use. So to honor this room, we um, actually cap captured this photo. And you'll see in the in a video walkthrough, which we'll present, that we um, printed this photo on glass and um, then installed it in the window that um, looked from the moker that looked into this room. Um, so it, it kind of honored the people that, that uh, served this room. Visitor viewing area, this is um, how it looked, obviously in 1968. Just wanted to point out that um, kind of the ashtrays on the back of some of the con uh, some of those chairs, as well as um, ashtrays at the end of the rows and kind of at the bottom row. There's a wooden shelf along the, uh, the front windows. And that window looks into the uh, mission control room. Uh, there's also a quiet sign that's still present in the room, which we restored. And then the it's kind of the ceiling mounted TV up there. We actually uh, had consultants, I believe it's Cosmos here, re uh, recreate a retro housing and then create a LED um, LCD screen. So it's a um, modern TV made to look like a replica. Um, and you can, you can kind of tell from this photo, but the, uh, and you'll, you'll, you'll see it when we look at the chair fabric, but the chairs do actually change from a, like an orange to a red, they, every other row, you can kind of see a huge change in this black and white photo. But we'll, we'll show you the color one shortly. Uh, this would be a communication booth right next to the visitor viewing area. And um, just want to show you this photo because this was um, one of the rooms we kind of tried to faithfully restore with equipment. Um, there's, um, uh, again, ashtrays, rotary telephones, uh, TV, and then some communication equipment. And, <laughs> and along, along with the photos, we had NASA gave us a full set of the original construction drawings that they had on file, as well as um, subsequent renovations that took place. Um, so we, it was um, in kind of invaluable to, uh, for us to see the process of the room as it changed and try and um, we referenced this, uh, the drawings 
uh, heavily during the restoration process to create our drawings. Um, just to point out, so this drawing, kind of hard to see, but it's um, it does show you the all the original elevations, calling out wall, uh, the original wall finishes, um, the different details with the reveals between between materials. Um, there's a standing desk detail, which is in the back of the visitor viewing room, which we restored. And uh, we kept referencing this drawing to figure out what the appropriate covering would be. Um, and uh, there was a part of these drawings was also a, a finish schedule. So we were through that, which we referenced to help kind of track down some of these original materials and manufacturers. Um, one, um, and another step we used to do this research was actually interviewing some of the retired flight controllers. Um, this was very helpful for uh, Cosmosphere. We restored the consoles so they could um, learn how the flight controllers used it, what buttons they might have pressed during. Um, as David said, Apollo 17, so that's what the consoles would be used. But um, we, we were also given the opportunity to ask them, you know, what the original finishes look like that are no longer present or where things were located and, and what personal items they might like return to the room. And they also, um, we'll go back one more, sorry. Um, the last photo is actually um, a lot of the flight controllers, which was extremely helpful. They gave us um, their documents that were used during Apollo 11 to scan and recreate um, some of the tracking maps, the, um, the flight controller logs, all the documents that you'll see that we staged all pretty much came from um, either NASA records or from the flight controller donations. Um, this the next few slides are just some kind of examples of our construction drawings, just how, kind of how um, detailed we went. So um, a lot of these tags reference um, kind of narratives that went in depth about each item, but um, it shows you for that far wall, you know, all the coat racks actually, uh, we track down each um, each uh, sport coat, and we through donations on on the campus, we were able to get enough black binders to fill the bookcases. Um, again, finding a calendar to go where there, where we noticed the calendar was during um, uh, during the photo research. And um, one thing to note here is that that gray square behind the coat rack is. Um, an actually a, a piece of original wallpaper that we found behind, a, behind an electrical panel. And uh, the client um, requested that we keep that in place as well as the um, uh, Texas Historical Commission. So we, um, we actually kind of repaired it a little, like stuck it back with glue and then um, encapsulated it in place. Um, again, this is just a, uh, one of our drawings is showing each console and how um, how detailed all the staging equipment that um, Delaney was able to locate online and eBay and through all different resources and uh, just showing exactly through through our photo evidence we had to um, show where it would be placed and why it was um, kind of give evidence of when it was there why it was there um, and Delaney can expound on this uh, um, sometimes she argued with the flight controllers that um, she had photographic evidence that a, like a coffee cup was on top of the console. They would argue um, that they would never do that. So um, uh, the, and then again, just we, we um, had to, um, Delaney is going to talk more about the chairs, but we, uh, we did, did um, several plans with the chairs because we only could only find so many historic chairs left at Johnson Space Center and um, a few of them were donated, but we um, Delaney worked through different staging plans for the chairs and uh, this is an example of that. And again, a, a staging plan just continuing to showing kind of how, how detailed we got. O overall, our, we had 167 um, drawings to um, help with this restoration, just different aspects. And so these are just a few of these small sheets. Um, this is a early on in the process. One of the first things to go was the consoles. Um, they got shipped to uh, Kansas City, where Cosmosphere is, um, 
and they actually took apart all the, they removed all the existing uh, guts of the equipment, um, tagged them, returned them back to NASA once they were done, and then um, swapped out the, the, the screens for LCD screens, LED push buttons, um, that they could uh, change the lights to try and get it correct. Some of the lights we had to tweak because they were coming on red when they should have been green. Um, it, was a, it was a very neat process. Um, and again, this just kind of shows before the um, real restoration work started. This is on the left hand side is the original carpet and with the consoles removed. And then also um, on the far side, you'll see actually the wallpaper, the non-historic wallpaper was removed. Um, that's why the walls kind of had those white streaks. That's where glue patches were and some of the wall patching was done, wall repair. Um, and then there's also some linear uh, AC diffusers that we removed because they were, weren't historic to the room. And then on the right-hand side, that's the visitor viewing area with the um, theater seats removed, um, kind of showing the the state of the carpet with the stains and uh, again the kind of the walls the walls have the wallpaper in it um, and then through through um, with using the uh, I guess Yanni Langer with source historics he was um, able to locate one of the original ceiling tiles at NASA which is the middle photo the top kind of patinaed yellow tile that's um, the original tile that would have been in the room. Um, we were, we found um, a similar textured tile from Armstrong, but it did not have the same hole punch pattern. So we, using a photograph, we by hand transcribed the hole pattern and hand punched it and then um, digitized that and provided that to the um, contractor who then using a CNC machine and also kind of then just creating a hand stamp, a uh, hand stamp punched all of the um, I think we had 5,000 square feet of ceiling tile and they hand punched every single one of them. Um, and then on the far left, you'll see a, a hand punched ceiling tile and, and returned to its place and also a original smoke detector, which we located in another building at Johnson Space Center. And uh, um, when the ceiling was opened up, we actually could see the exact location where they were because they were still a junction box. So we were able to exactly return the smoke detectors to their spot. Um, and this is a final, um, a fully restored ceiling. Um, you'll notice the ceiling grid is still um, kind of an off-white yellow. That's um, the natural patina of the paint kind of turned it that yellow because we did actually thoroughly by hand scrub the grid to remove the tar and tobacco from that had built up over the years of smoking in the room. Um, and the THC did not want to um, kind of cover up the historic fabric. So we were left with that kind of yellow finish. Um, but we do have the new ceiling tiles with the hand punched original pattern. Um, you'll see a few of the original smoke detectors. Um, there's a pipe coming down. That's where a camera originally was that we located during our photo research. And then um, there's some kind of low profile smoke detectors to bring it up to code. And then to uh, make sure the building remains secure and um, kind of new uh, protocols are, are enforced. We uh, installed some really small low profile security cameras um, that when someone crosses a, a set line and the alarms actually go off and alert the client who kind of sends security out there to yell at them. Um, this, um, these slides show the new wallpaper and that the large photo. Um, but we do want to, I guess I'll start with the bottom right. That's the original wallpaper from the Apollo era. Um, that's that kind of, kind of tan rectangle. And then around it is the wallpaper that was installed during the shuttle era renovation. So that's the wallpaper we, we removed. Uh, we were able to find that historic wallpaper behind things like uh, fire extinguisher, thermostats, um, electrical panels and um, where we found it we left it in place and then um, above the next photo above is the original wallpaper on the right and then through um, like I said through the um, 
original sk finished schedule in the drawings, we were able to locate, um, it, it gave us the original manufacturer and through just online searching, we found out which the um, uh, Carousel was the, um, actually had bought the original company and through buying the company, they actually had the original drum, the vinyl drum that was used to run that wallpaper. Um, and it's the original pattern. It's been retooled a couple of times as over the years kind of to keep the texture fresh. So that's why there's a slight um, kind of sharpness to the new, but it is the exact same um, drum used to create the Apollo wallpaper. Um, we did have to do a custom color match, um, which was done and uh, we created a custom run of wallpaper. And then the large photo you can see is the new wallpaper kind of around one of the historic rectangles, which I pointed out earlier. Um, the, the historic carpet was located under these pneumatic tubes um, systems that were, uh, each console had their own pneumatic tubes to send messages to different departments in the building. Um, these were never moved. Um, during any of the renovations. So we were able to find the historic carpet, which is a, um, it's in that photo on the bottom right, it's the, it's the carpet that's kind of on the right and it's a woven product. Um, now our time constraint and also budget didn't allow us to do woven, but we using a tufted project or uh, product, we were able to do a custom color dye um, to, to recreate the exact color. And then we found a carpet pattern that that using a tufted process created a similar kind of uh, look. So we did a custom uh, custom run. Um, and as David alluded to, these are not typical raised floor tile dimensions. They're actually 28 by 28 and nobody makes a, a floor tile that, or carpet tile that's 28 by 28. So we did have to do a large kind of broad loom run of carpet and then they hand cut each for each square glued it in place. And then through our um, photo research, we did see that the carpet had a quarter turn, kind of look each, each square turns 90 degrees to its neighbor. Um, and um, one other thing to point out here is the kind of discolored carpet, which has been replaced with a better patch, but it's uh, that's the original carpet we kind of pieced together and uh, returned to a spot to kind of help visitors in the room see what the original fabric was compared to the restoration. Um, this slides show some of the historic, um, um, kind of historic wall finishes and colors that we found. And then some of the art, our attempts at uh, kind of color matching. The left side, the transom panel above had never been painted over. So that's the original color to the room. And then the doors below, they had been painted several times, but um, that little kind of lighter gray color, that was our color match that we did. The next panel over, um, Yanni Langer, again from Source, um, was able to locate, he noticed through photos that the stencil was a little different and kind of not in the same space. So he did some investigated, investigative work and was able to un fully uncover the original stencil. And uh, by hand, he then went back and refreshed it using the black paint. Um, these, this is the uh, theater seat. So the, in the visitor viewing room, on the right-hand side, that photo, the large photo, you see the really soiled one. That was the state of the chair cushions before we started the restoration. Um, now that the, the the lighting in there is dark, but you could still before the restoration happened, you could still t tell those chairs were filthy. Um, and then on the right hand side, the that's a fully restored um, and clean fabric. That's um, a nylon fabric, so it held up, but it's um, and it allowed us to clean it pretty well. So all the original fabric was able to be restored and put back in place. They received new cushions. Um, and that top hand corner kind of hints at the cigarette. Um, ashtrays I pointed out earlier were actually um, the uh, Melanie from Textile Preservations was able to find the original patent number for that ashtray lid and um, had it scanned and 3D printed. So there's new plastic, um, or I'm sorry, they're metal 3D printed lids to all the missing ashtrays that are on the back. Um, and uh, all the chairs were 
kind of the mechanisms were restored. Um, some of them had been broken over the years, and the chairs were then bolted, and placed back in the put back into place. All right, I guess I'm going to take it from here and kind of continue with the nitty gritty of the restoration um, project and steps. So. Uh, we were able to find, I think, 20, 20 uh, swivel chairs on base that were already um, ready for the restoration. Only about three of these are actual original steel case chairs from the Apollo era. And then there's many more steel case chairs that were um, brought in in the 60s and 70s. And then there also are these kind of typical government issued chairs that kind of have this gray green vinyl um, both with and without arms and with um, just straight legs and then also some with casters. And we were able to find a lot of these chairs on base. Uh, Jordan and I did a lot of um, just roaming around on the campus and going through buildings and, and taking furniture and not and just trying to look like we were meant to be there. <laughs> um, and hope that nobody asked too many questions. Um, so we worked with Steel Case. They were able to um, to tell us what the exact chair was. So we found the chair and we did a call through Docomomo uh, US, a, a national nonprofit that works, uh, that preserves modern architecture and advocates for its preservation. And they helped us try to do a call for chairs to try and find more and more steel case chairs. Uh, we were given some leads, we found a few more, but um, unfortunately at, at some point OSHA declared four pronged chairs um, to be unsafe. So government agencies started to remove these chairs. So. Uh, I think a lot of them ended up in landfills. Um, a lot are in private homes and people have them, but trying to find, you know, 20 of them was, was not the easiest task. But we continue to work with Steelcase for the ones that we did have, and um, we were able to get find the specs for both the vinyl and the woven fabric. So you can see the seat has vinyl and woven fabric on the seat and on the seat back. Uh, we were able to find a pretty good match for the vinyl just off the shelf. Um, the woven seat fabric was a little bit more difficult. We couldn't find anything off the shelf that was even a cl close to matching. So we ended up talking to the local Houston Weavers Guild and we engaged a local weaver to uh, hand weave the fabric. We just were able to give her the steel case card and say, we need this. And she came back with, you know, several samples and got very close. So here is our original, and here's this new woven seat fabric that um, our, our weaver did at her home studio on her loom. So here's the final product with our, our weaver, uh, Mary Welch. And here's one of the chairs completely reupholstered to match the original Apollo 11 conditions. And so other elements that we had to locate were the pyramid top trash cans. Um, these were going to be very costly to remanufacture. We were willing to do that, but again, Jordan and I did some hunting and we located four of them across campus, which was what we needed. They had been painted white and the, the 80s NASA logo was applied. So we did some scratch tests and determined a color, an appropriate color to paint them back to the Apollo 11 color. And so other things that we found on our hunting were um, these stacked metal bookcases. Some situations they have feet, some they just sit on the floor. Uh, some of these metal uh, paper trays. We did a call through the email system at NASA on the J Johnson Space, um, at Johnson Space Center for anything Apollo era related and put boxes in multiple buildings and people just threw in what they could. So we ended up with plenty of binders to fill the room from the era, these kind of black press board with, with silver, um, uh, I guess, attachments. We found several of the original uh, coat racks and their, their metal coat hangers that came with them. Uh, we found one standing ashtray that wasn't in very good condition, but we were able to have that restored. And here's one of the boxes with just, um, you know, just stuff just piled in. So we're able to, through the photos and videos, really hone in on every single object that was in the room. And through mostly eBay and Etsy, um, acquire vintage items. 
that were needed to, to fill this space. We were very excited to find this coffee maker, which first was very hard to, to see in the photos. It's kind of in a back corner. And it took us a minute to be able to identify it. And once we did, it's called the Regal Rocket. And we were able to find one that was new in the box still on eBay and just other kind of coffee related items. And so every, every um, flight operator really just brought a mug from home. Um, they, a lot of them are very unfortunate looking, but <laughs> they were what were in the room. And uh, we were able to find um, the exact mugs, exact colors, exact vintage. Um, I know more about 1969 coffee mugs than I should at this point. So some other items, we had book boxes donated to the, to the restoration, vintage briefcases. Um, these are recording devices that were donated by flight controllers. We had to get some glasses, tape dispensers, staplers, pens, pencils, um, hole punchers, three and two hole punchers. These are magnets that were used to hang the clipboards on the back of the the consoles, every time I was in a building in NASA and I saw any of these, I would, I would take it and put it in my, my bag. Um, ashtrays and other, you know, smoking um, devices. These ashtrays that are throughout the room are actually made for cigar smoking, but they were of the right capacity for the amount of smoking that happened in the room. Um, I was able to find, I think we needed about 20 to 30 of these for, for the staging. <laughs> And a few were donated from the campus and from, from flight operators who had taken them home, but mostly acquired vintage. And there were some clear ones. This tobacco pouch was actually found underneath the floor. So we put it back in its place on a console above. Um, you know, a cigar box that was seen in a photo. Um, this is, these are trench matchbooks that the men that worked in the very front row of the Moker, they worked in the trench. And, I won't go into detail of why it was called the trench right now, but um, they had custom matches made for their team, for their group, and one of the, the flight operators donated a few for the, the restoration. And I believe this cigarette pack was also found underneath the floor, and then we also had to acquire some more. And so now I'll just kind of show you some, some quick images of the restored room. So here we are looking from the very back row. Um, you can see that the screens are reanimated. This was also another team that was a group that was part of our larger team put together a visitor viewing um, experience and, and their job included replicating every single one of these items and charts that was projected um, because they did not exist anymore. Um, so they had to, through looking at photo and film, this graphic was created by a graphic artist to, to put back on the screen. Um, here's a look at the, the flight director's console. So this is where Jane Kranz and the other flight directors would sit during their, their shift. Um, one good I'll point out here, this was the only um, wooden book box that remained from the era. So we placed it in its spot next to this console and we just left it with its kind of patina showing its age. And then we had to make new book boxes based off of its dimensions that, that are throughout the room. Um, one item that I really like to talk about is, is this mug, which um, was Gene Krantz's flu mug, which was a gift from the controllers um, during a time when Gene Krantz was um, very adamant that every, every flight controller get his flu shot to where he had a doctor standing at the door giving out flu shots as the controllers walked it for their shift. So as kind of a gag gift, um, one of the controllers had this mug painted and it's a FD for flight director and it says flu um, director and white is crossed out because he was the white team flight director. So they crossed out white, made him the flu director and painted a syringe on the side. And so the original mug, this mug is, is owned by a person and, and we were unable to acquire it for this restoration but um, through photos, I was able to find the exact mug on eBay that it's painted on. And then I hand painted from the photos, um, the mug back to its condition. And this is the success for me because Jean Krantz, I think still thinks this is the original mug sitting there and it's, it's my, my handiwork. So yes, I succeeded. 
Um, here's just some console details, kind of the level of, of things that we had to, to put in the room from doing large, you know, scale wallpaper to make, putting number two pencils, you know, in exact locations. And we found an RC Cola can um, that go, that's in the console where the, these gentlemen seem to drink a lot of RC Cola right at this, this area. Mugs, here's some of the reproduced flight manuals. Um, I'm just kind of going down another row, some more mugs, there's stopwatches, pipes, tobacco tins, paper and styrofoam cups, there's a slide ruler here. Um, the ashtrays here, you don't see it, but we actually um, burned cigarette tubes that were didn't have any tobacco in them and kind of crunched them up and they fill all the ashtrays, so the ashtrays look like they're they're being used. Again, like Jordan said, it's, it's as if the flight controllers just got up and all, all walked out of the room. And another console, here's, you know, we were able to locate several of the P P-tube canisters and clean them up. So these are like at the bank when you would, um, just like at the bank that you would use. So you'd lift this flap and a controller could send a note or a message to their team members that were working the back rooms throughout the throughout the building. Um, headsets, we were able to get uh, lots of headsets that were they're stored in um, Sandra Tetley's office. She actually was collecting them as she could. Um, we were able to buy some from the original manufacturer who makes almost the exact same headsets still um, to this day. And, and it was off the shelf ready. Here's one of those trench matchbooks is sitting down here. This is one of the trench consoles. And then you can also see all of these screens are reanimated. Each console screen is showing what, what they would have looked at at the time. And the buttons are relit up. And so here's kind of just an overall view from the, the corner. And this is actually a little bit before it was complete. It actually gets filled up with a, even more stuff, more paper, um, more binders. Uh, just, I mean, it, it was a workspace, so it was full of stuff. But we're, we hope that this um, comes close to uh, what it looked like during Apollo 11. And now I guess I'll hand it back over to David, but we have a kind of a quick little uh, video to walk you through so you can actually kind of almost get a, a real life tour from wherever you are seated right now. Um, should I go ahead and start the video, David? Sure. It's a, it's a short video and it'll kind of conclude our presentation, but it'll give you the experience. And if you were, um, this is the way the visitors enter. These are, these, we reframe these um, uh, sketches that were done uh, that during the time, so you're, this is what you would see when you enter the visitor um, viewing room. And again, all of the upholstery and the carpet is original to the room, um, just been cleaned by Melanie and her, Melanie and her team um, uh, out of uh, Allen, Texas, uh, not far from you all. Um, again, most visitors don't go into the Moker, but there are level nine tours. And one of the things that we were asked to do was make a door where there was not a door. So this door on the left that you see covered in wallpaper is a new entrance that allows um, what these are called level nine tours that can actually go into the space, um, but they cannot go up on, onto the, uh, the trays. Um, but we will do that in this video. And so um, we tried to, you know, we tried to make the door look like it's not an original door. Uh, it's just, it's, it is as recessive as possible. Um, see these are flight director. Um, each of the flight directors had a, um, had a plaque. And on the right, you see these are the shuttle um, emblems that we relocated. They're still in the room. They're just not in the um, viewing area of what would be the Apollo um, view corridor. On the right is the Roker. That's the, the window that uh, Jordan mentioned. We, we put that photograph. Um, photograph on the glass and installed that. And Gene Krantz was one of the great moments when he walked in and saw that photograph as if he was still looking into that room. He was taken aback. And again, this, is, this was actually taken a little bit earlier, so there's a lot more stuff in the room actually today, but um, we were having a hard time staging it because of all the press going on at the time. 
um, we couldn't, we had to wait till late at night to get back in the room to do our work. And so it was just um, kind of a frenzy. Um, above that drinking fountain, there's a very special mirror um, we'll talk a little bit about. Um, but um, so this is the lower tray, which is called the trench. Those pneumatic tubes, those aren't plastic or, you know, like at the bank, they're actually aluminum. And for some reason on this lower level, they, when they would pop out of the bottom, they would fall on the floor and roll around and make a great ruckus. And one of the flight directors uh, at that, in that lower level was um, served in Korea and uh, part of a munitions um, battery. And he kept re remarking, it sounded like he was back in Korea and the spent canisters were hitting the floor. And that's where the name trench came from and it stuck. Um, again, you see the, the book boxes, um, had lids on them so that the lid kind of su supports the box as it just sits on that little miniature ledge. And there would be lots and lots of people sitting on that small ledge as well. Um, there were four teams um, for the Apollo program. You had to show up a few hours early, uh, sit down next to the flight control um, director that was in the room before they handed off to you. And when um, the moon landing occurred. I think most of them all showed up at the same time. So it was just packed full of people. Uh, you can see the roses in the, in the front of the, the, in the front left corner of this image. That's the mission roses. Um, an anonymous uh, person would donate um, roses to the mission and it's never been uh, disclosed who, uh, what family was doing that. But we do know that uh, one of the last orders like in the, the shuttle program came from a family that was now in Dallas. So we think that it's a family who's um, carrying on that tradition for, for their parents. Again, that's looking into the Roker. That, that's that view that Gene Kranz and Jordan talked about earlier. That's the Regal Rocket coffee maker. It still had inspector's uh, tag inside of it. And again, it was really, it was fun to see the flight controllers when they finally saw the room, you know, no one was very excited about carpet or wallpaper, but when all the coffee cups and ashtrays and all the gadgets, um, they really got excited. In fact, Jay Krantz walked to that coffee, walked up to that coat rack, walked in the room, he hung up his coat on that coat rack like he was going to work like every other day as just matter of fact, and people kind of took note, note of that. And, um, and so we were really, even that television set is from New Jersey. It's never, it was never turned on. It's never been turned on. It's just, it's an authentic um, uh, television that was actually found. Some of the other items had to be 3D printed as Jordan was mentioning. Um, if we couldn't find it, we had to replicate it. Like the camera that you see there is a 3D print of the original camera. And you see the graphics. Um, um, and it was you know, the very talented team that came in. And, and even the, the flag uh, that you see, there's a story there with the flag. Um, um, that flagpole was erected during the mission of Apollo 11. Um, and there's a story with that flag. Um, the flag is meant to be on the moon, but um, they sent a flag up and then brought back the other, another flag. But it's, it, um, we, can, we can talk more about that when we conclude the presentation. So uh, that's kind of the, the end of this, this section. This is sort of the, again, this is the, this is almost everyone on our restoration team. This is where there's a few people um, on the contractors team that were not available for this photo, but um, it was a really large effort and it was an effort that everyone was really proud to be a part of. Um, again, I'm not sure how we, how questions will, will be coming if, if they're coming to us, but um, um, we want to thank everyone for, for hanging in there and um, and um, turn, it, turn it over back to, the, um, to Dallas. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. That is really fascinating, all the little details that you guys went through. Um, so does anybody have any questions for our speakers? There was one in the chat box, Irene. Oh, uh, yeah. Where, yeah. You want to go ahead and ask it? Um, yeah, so they said, were the original flight control monitors square or rounded displays? Uh, the original ones were rounded, and then when they, when Cosmosphere did their renovation, they actually kept the kind of uh, uh, rounded uh, 
kind of face plate of the uh, screens, but the screen itself is now kind of flat and square. Mm. So you kind of get the illusion that it still has a convex sur uh, surface. And one thing I'd, I'll mention is that one of the things we had to do was, um, Jordan mentioned that all the buttons that light up are now LED and all the lighting in the, in the room is now LED. And um, we were required to re remove um, the power from the from existing building uh, to a separate uh, um, source so that if there was anything happened in this room um, adversely, it wouldn't affect the mission below. But like in the bat cave, um, there were, there were back in the, there were these big Ida four projectors and they, they had the light output of like a locomotive um, lantern on a, on a train and they um, off gassed heat and all kind of oily smells. And there was a whole team of people working in the bat cave, just changing out the light bulbs, like, you know, quite often. And, and for this project to succeed, we needed to have something that was more stable that would not require, um, you know, a 10 person team just to keep changing out light bulbs and all the equipment. And so that's also why we used, um, we changed things. The, the light fixtures uh, in the ceiling are actually the original light fixtures. We just found LED replacement bulbs. And so we were just able to change out the bulb, but things are, um, will operate for, with, more efficiently. Um, the other thing about this building, it's probably good to know, you know, the air conditioning system largely didn't produce heat originally because all the heat from these um, lights and projectors and all the uh, multiple computer, uh, comp giant computer, IBM computers, put out so much heat that even if it were, you know, 30 degrees outside, they were still cooling the building with air conditioning because, um, and so as they've made things more efficient, they've had to add um, heating back into the building and other, other aspects to, um, because it was really designed to be um, like, like, a, like a, a, a computer room that would be air conditioned year round, so. And then I've got a couple more questions. Um, how do you all feel about people coming into the viewing space and how well will it hold up to so many people sitting in the chairs each day? Um, I'll, I can answer. I'll, I'll take a step. Um, so one of the big challenges that um, we had to deal with, but, but more so uh, Sandra Tetley had to deal with, was kind of addressing the culture of NASA that you used to be able to go into this room, one, if you were a NASA employee, anytime you wanted with friends or family, whoever you brought on base and um, give it you know, a personal tour, which, which was great, but it also was um, really abusing this space and, and um, that's how buttons disappeared. And you know, there's, photos of, there's photos of dogs sitting on top of these consoles. Um, it just, part of the furnishings report recommendations really said that this, there's way too much traffic going on in this room as for a historic national landmark and it needed to be cut down significantly. Um, so she fought and she advocated for now, really the visitor experience is done through the visitor viewing room and they, you can sit in those original seats and you are gonna walk on the carpet. Um, there's a plan in place to try to clean and preserve it. Those items as, as much as possible as, as people are filtering through. But um, there's a limit now to how many people are going in and out um, constantly. And then on the floor, like David mentioned before, there's now, that's kind of only a VIP level, uh, much pricier level ticket to get to go down on the floor. And that really now only goes in front. You can walk down and around the front of the room, but you can't get up in the console areas. Um, so all these, these things aren't going to disappear off these consoles and, um, and hopefully it'll maintain its look for, for longer than the restoration that, that kind of happened before. Um, I hope that answers the question. I think it's very rare to be able to go to a, a, a landmark this, like this and sit in the original seats though. And, and the times I've been there, the Josephs have been very good to kind of scold kids that have their feet on the, the seats and, and really kind of monitor, I think, uh, Sandra has, has beaten into them that they need to, to really take pride in this space and the docents definitely do. So um, we'll, we'll just have to see how, how that visitor viewing room holds up. Wonderful. Um, so I have another question. It says, what was the biggest surprise of the original materials found in the place? Um, we did find like original uh, cigarettes 
under some of the floor tiles, which uh, the client Sandra Tetley uh, made it. She was adamant and clear she wanted to keep all of them. She has it in a little bag. I think we even staged some of them um, in, in some of the ashtrays we put back. Um, anyone else? I really like the Regal Rocket coffee pot because the, the photo that we were able to look at, you know, we could just basically see a, a sliver of a foot and then you, another photo or video, we were able to get a, another piece of it, like the lid. And, and I think Jordan just randomly saw it, you know, with the eBay search, you start to get good at what, what descriptions you need to type in to try and find an item. And um, it's just such a handsome coffee pot and, and, and just such a, a very um, telling uh, item of the time, its design, and, and just also just the statement that this was, this was an office for these gentlemen. This was where they went and had sat and did their job all day and drank coffee like the rest of us at our desks. I think for me it was the carpet, um, you know, because we've been told, again, the ceiling tiles, the, the wallpaper and the carpet had 100% been removed and, and uh, you know, they were at the beginning, they were trying to look, just find carpet books and show them to flight controllers and see, does that look familiar? You know, it was such a chaotic process because memories, you know, even short term memories are, are not very accurate. And um, we had we had actually understood that all the consoles, including the P2 stations, had been re removed uh, for the shuttle uh, reworking. And so when the when they started to remove the first consoles, which were done in phases, um, um, you know, they removed the consoles and then, but they did remove the P2 stations. And so when we acquired, because the plan was to remove the P2 stations, um, they said, well, we can't remove them because they're hard piped to the ground. And that's, that's when we asked the question, well, if they're hard piped today, the how, you know, how do they remove them during shuttle? And so the answer was they didn't. And that's so when we got underneath them, um, and there wasn't a lot left, but we were able to find enough to, to, to see that that carpet was woven. And today, uh, folks don't, woven carpet isn't made um, in that kind of way. It's a very labor intensive uh, operation. And so um, that's what we had to rely on the best we could do. And we made uh, countless numbers of tests uh, were done. And e even the, you know, we had to make a decision on, there were some carpets that looked great six inches away, some six feet away, some 10 feet away. We had to determine even what the vantage point would be. But um, we always we always let the, the, the Park Service and the, and the Texas Store Commission um, had a final say on, on all things. And so we, we let them pick the carpet they wanted. And so that was mine. Very cool. Um, another question was, what was the final price tag of this project? Well, I think the price is what um, is roughly uh, five and a half million dollars. Um, there's some aspects of it that we, um, we don't know the actual price, I will say, because one of the things about working in this building is that um, all of the, the contractors and the tradespeople that we brought in um, could not work on electrical systems or mechanical systems um, in the building. So there's, a, there's actually a special guild on the base. Um, their acronym is PAE, and they're the ones who touch anything. Um, even above the ceiling contained asbestos uh, fireproofing. So uh, all that work had to occur um, using their guild, and we we don't actually know what they were charging. So um, I'll just say it's it's um, for all the things we know, it's five and a half million, and um, that's that's all we can say about that. Okay, and then I have one last question: What's the story about the mirror over the water fountain? Who wants to take that one? You can go ahead. Um, so you've all seen the, you know, the, the Tom Hanks movie where, you know, the Apollo mission blows up and um, uh, and 13 and um, they barely make it back. Um, but they do make it back, as you know. You've seen the movie, you know the story, you were alive uh, largely when that happened. And one of the things that the astronauts did on that mission where they presented this mirror that was on that, um, on that spacecraft uh, uh, to the uh, to the flight controllers. I don't know if we have a blown up picture of it. There's an inscription on it, um, but uh, but but basically, what it says is when you um, uh, when you look in this mirror, you see a hero. 
when there was there was a decision by the flight operators to mount that right above the the drinking fountain so it was it was kind of a a place where you would you would go often and and pass by right by the front door of, of where they would come in for their shift so it wasn't there during uh, Apollo 11, but the team felt that it was um, a significant um, artifact. There was no other place that, that that item could go, really. Very interesting. Well, wonderful. Well, I want to thank the three of you so much for presenting this to our group. I think we've had a, a really good turnout, and I think a lot of people were interested in this project just because it's kind of a a little bit of history that everyone has a memory of. Um, we really appreciate it so much. Um, I want to thank everybody for um, attending this presentation tonight. We hope to see you next week, um, Tuesday night, six o'clock for the Co um, Coffin County Poor Farm. Um, we have three presentations left, so we hope to see you guys at the following. And then don't forget about Thursday, it's North Texas